All right. Well, hello and welcome on this last day of summer. The leaves are turning here in Northern Ontario and giving us a spectacular palette of colors. Uh, great to see we have participants from all over the world today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. On behalf of Contact North, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar. The webinar today is the future of learning technology, 10 key tools and methods. My name is Sarah Govro and I'm the director of Teach Online and the online learning news at Contact North. And I will be moderating the session today. I'd like to start off with a provincial land acknowledgement, respectfully acknowledging that Contact North's work and the work of our community partners takes place on traditional indigenous territories across the province. We are grateful to be able to work and live in these territories. We are thankful to the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial and who have continued to strengthen Ontario and all communities across the province. Well, thank you. Okay, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. The chat is open. Just remember to select everyone on the pull down menu so everyone can uh, see your, your comments or questions, or sorry, comments. But if you do have questions, please enter them into the Q&A tool. You will find that tool at the bottom of your screen and there will be um, some time perhaps at the end of the session to address those. Um, you can upvote questions so that the little thumbs icon found at the bottom of each question. And if you click on that, it just means that that question resonates with you or maybe you have the same kind of question and that will bring that question right to the top of the list. I would also like to point out, we do have closed captioning or live captioning. Um, you can activate that through the clo closed caption tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, once the webinar is finished, I will post the link to the recording as well as the presentation slides to teachonline.ca and I'll put that link in the chat momentarily. It will also get emailed to you in about 24 hours uh, through our Zoom system. All right, on to the main event. I would like to introduce our speaker today, Stephen Downs, Research Associate at Contact North. Welcome, Stephen, and thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks. Pleasure to be here. Oh, <laughs> and we've lost Sarah. Um, so I'm still, I'm still here. I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's just your photo has appeared instead of you. <laughs> okay. Um, shall I start then, or did you have anything else you wanted to say? That is it. The floor is yours. Okay, thanks everybody. Welcome to this session. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm going to share my slides. Whoops, that's not how you do it. Um, so that you can see my thinking in motion. And uh, okay, and oops. Okay. <laughs> Oh, my presentations always begin with a little bit of a, a mess. Um, okay, so today's topic is the future of learning technology, 10 key tools and methods. Uh, it's going to be focused mostly on technology and mostly on technology trends. I know that there's a whole bunch of other stuff to cover. Um, but uh, I'm going to keep fairly narrowly focused. That said, the breadth of this presentation will be unfortunately staggering. Um, so I want to remind you to keep in mind the idea here isn't for you to remember everything as I talk about it. The idea here is for you to have thoughts, whatever those thoughts are, questions, ideas, etc., and maybe jot them down or, or, or type them down as the presentation goes on, put them in the question area, put them in the chat area. Uh, I'm not really able to see the chat right now, but it's not for me necessarily to answer these questions. These questions are the future avenues of research and development. Um, I wanna begin 
by talking about briefly about the future of learning that's already here. And these are the things I won't be talking about, although pretty much everyone is talking about these, these, them these days. Artificial intelligence, uh, the tools we have for analytics, the tools we have for generating new content, uh, deep fakes, all of that sort of thing. The tool we're using to produce the live transcription of this uh, presentation. Uh, it's here now, and of course, there's a lot going to happen, but it's not a future trend anymore. It's here now. The metaverse. Um, again, it's here now. It's not fully developed, and a lot of the things that I'll talk about in this presentation come from the metaverse and will apply to the metaverse, but things like virtual reality and augmented reality, these are technologies that are current being, currently being used in a learning setting, I've done work myself developing and trying some of these VR and AR technologies, and there are widespread pilot projects and fully implemented systems today. Blockchain. Everybody's talking about blockchain. Again, many of the technologies that I'm talking about today are derived from blockchain, but blockchain is something that's here now. It exists, obviously. Um, and it's beginning to improve. We have things like non-fungible tokens or NFTs. We have things like the Ethereum merge, which converted the Ethereum blockchain to a new kind of energy efficient uh, system of records, etc. Uh, again, a lot of pilot projects. It isn't fully deployed, but it's not the future anymore. It's here. So these are the things that I'm not talking about. What I am talking about is where the future will go. And we can draw some lessons from the recent pandemic that we just uh, experienced. Uh, for example, the pivot to online learning that we experienced and that we're still experiencing today with, yes, yet another Zoom presentation. It was in many ways flawed, but it was flawed in ways that helped us learn about how we really do want to do online learning in the future. Uh, as well, the pivot to remote learning exposed issues of equity and access, diversity, equity, inclusion. These things came to the fore and we saw how existing educational systems and existing online systems are not serving all populations equally well. I live in rural Ontario, and it wasn't until the COVID pandemic that internet service providers got serious about providing broadband internet out here. Um, so all of these issues now are in the balance as we move toward the future. We've got the existing technologies of blockchain, AI, metaverse, We've got issues of pedagogy, issues of access, um, and more. And then we have these future tools and methods. So what I'm going to do is talk about these future tools and methods, but these questions, these gaps still remain. And it's not for me to answer all of these questions. I have my thoughts, obviously, but the questions have to come from all of you. The answers have to come from all of you. And you know, if there's a central message to this presentation, that might be it. So what are these 10 things? Well, the first one is the web of data. Um, and this is probably the most significant transformation in knowledge and learning happening right now. We are shifting from an environment where uh, teaching and learning is conducted as a narrative sequence of events, um, you know, simple sequencing, uh, moving from one topic to the next, a course as a series of sessions. We're moving to something different now. And what we're moving to is a course as a web of data, of interconnected data. Now I had in my mind this 
lovely animation for this particular slide that I would do, where I'd have one web or graph and you know all of the issues and then another one all of the concepts and another one all of the models and they all link together but that would have taken me several weeks to make but imagine that and imagine a course looking like that imagine a course looking like this diagram that you see right in front of you how do you teach that we're not storytellers anymore we're not narrators uh we're now serving more in the role of explorers or guides. Uh, the web of data, some points to consider. First of all, open data. Um, there are numerous open data initiatives just getting started. They haven't really been integrated into educational applications, but it's coming very shortly. I'm thinking of things like the Government of Canada open data initiatives, or the announcement just yesterday from Crossref that they've opened up uh, millions of uh, cross-referenced citations from academic publications. There's a world of open data out there, and all of that is going to become accessible and part of our courses. Another topic to consider is the idea of data literacy. I did a big project on that this past year, and you can see the link to that on the slide. Uh, data literacy involves understanding how to look at, comprehend, manipulate, use data. And we can think of it from a variety of perspectives. We can think of it from the perspective of data management. We can think of it from the perspective of data science. Um, we can think of it from the perspective of data literacy, uh, information literacy, things like that. So different ways of looking at data literacy. And of course, it's going to become an increasingly important topic to consider in our educational systems of the future. Similarly, data ethics. How do we manage data? How do we collect data? How do we clean it? How do we augment it? There have been a variety of reports and inquiries on the question of data ethics. It, of course, ties directly into the question of ethics in artificial intelligence and analytics. And it also ties into uh, ethics as related to instructional design and online learning. Finally, designing for data. And this is what's going to impact what we are doing as educational technologists most directly. Um, how do we organize our learning materials to take into account, present, and allow people to work with all of this data that is now suddenly available to them? It's different from instructional design because the data is live, it's dynamic, it comes from a variety of sources, and it doesn't come with instruction built in. So the way we present it and the way we organize it needs to take into account the nature of the data, as well as the purpose that we have in presenting the data. Number two, told you, we're just zipping right through these. Virtualization. Now, in many respects, virtualization is already here. And some of the systems that I talk about, like VMware or Docker, have been around for a very long time, a long time in internet years, which is still shorter than the lifespan of a dog. Um, but we haven't actually seen virtualization come into our everyday experience. It's you know, second nature for developers uh, and web professionals to use, and there's a lot of it's happening behind the scenes. Uh, this whole webinar is almost certainly being run in a virtual environment, but we don't have these for personal use yet, and that's what's coming. What is virtualization? Well, you take a typical computer, say your computer on your desktop, or perhaps your phone has hardware operating systems and applications. That's the way it's structured. And what we do is we simulate the hardware 
with a virtualization layer. And so what that does is it allows us to, well, for one thing, run different operating systems and different applications on the same computer. So depending on with my computer, I could run a Python application and do some artificial intelligence processing, or I could run uh, a container with Unity or the Unreal Engine and do some virtual reality development, et cetera. It also allows us to take these images once I've created an image and run it on many different uh, hardware platforms. So I create an application fully configured with all of its data in it once, and then I can share that with 10, 100, 1,000, a million people. So this image can run not just on my computer, but on your computer, your neighbor's computer, et cetera. So these new kinds of resources, these new virtualizations allow us to redefine what we mean by textbooks or learning objects. In fact, it, it doesn't make sense to use a textbook anymore. And, and just as an aside, I don't know why people still write books. I honestly don't. Um, when they could be doing so much more. Um, instead of simply getting a, a sequence of text, a student can access a complex computing environment already pre-configured with activities, access to data, et cetera, built right in. So for example, they could work with an online interactive map with real time traffic and weather data. Oh yeah, just like Google Maps, but as a learning resource. Or they can build their own resources. Uh, virtualization, has allowed us to develop entire development environments um, specifically tailored to allowing people to build an application without having to install all of the material that they need, including text-based code, et cetera, on their computer. Here we have what we call uh, a no-code application development studio and we can see what's happening here um, they're just dragging and dropping elements of their interface or you know they, they can also drag and drop data sources or resources animations whatever and they're building their app and they're seeing their app appear in a virtual environment on the right hand side of our screen here Number three, graph. Again, it's an old concept. It's a very old concept. Um, it's already here, but it hasn't really hit us yet. Um, and, and let me draw the distinction for you. If you're still using things like uh, MS Word documents or uh, PowerPoint slide presentations or even Excel, you haven't plugged into the graph yet. Um, the graph is a network of things that are connected together. And there's a change of thinking that we need to have away from standalone documents and toward a whole set of interconnected entities. And it's, kind of, it's a hard mindset. To, to achieve and, and you know, until it's actually working right on your desktop, it's very difficult to, to imagine it. Um, but we already use the graph in many ways. For example, um, your social graph connects you with other people. And you, you already think of people and populations that way. You don't think of people, well, one person, another person, or another person. You think of groups, communities, networks, etc. you think of people as though they were a graph. A hash graph, we'll talk about that later, connects hashes. And we can think of all kinds of other graphs. I didn't create a whole bunch of slides for those. Um, a cricket graph connects crickets, a neural graph connects neurons, etc., etc. Graphs can be of different types. For example, a graph can be directed or undirected. An undirected graph 
the uh, connection can go both ways in a directed graph. Uh, the connection only goes one way. Uh, this is important. Time is a directed graph. It only goes one way. That's real, that becomes really important in a lot of network and data processing. Uh, I won't get into those, but trust me, it really does. Graphs can also be cyclic or acyclic. Uh, in a cyclic graph, you can create loops in the graph. But in an acyclic graph, everything eventually flows to one point uh, or you know, everything flows. You never go back to where you began. So you can have um, a directed acyclic graph where everything flows only in one direction and uh, there are no cycles in that directionality. That's called a DAG, and that structure is used to underlie a lot of the technology that we already use today. Blockchain is one example of it, but if you do coding on GitHub, that's another example of it. But graphs are important, not just because of the way they represent knowledge, but because of the way they allow us to access knowledge not simply as a collection of facts and statements, but rather as patterns that we can see. What you're looking at on the right is a graph. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, cyclic, it's undirected, but still it, it, the properties change as the distance between the different entities in the graph changes. Uh, in the, the different entities in the graph change, but we perceive movement in that graph. We see phenomena that emerge from that graph. So graphs enable the possibility of pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is an important component of knowledge and learning. As I said, graphs are everywhere in modern technology. We just don't see them yet, and we certainly don't think in them yet. Uh, and I can speak of that from personal experience, how hard it is to go from a world where I just write text in a Word document, or maybe I write computer code in a text processor, to a world like GitHub, where all of these things are connected in a graph. I've got versions, I've got, well, they don't call them masters anymore, but uh, the, the, the main branch, uh, we have commits, we have saves, we have blobs, tags, all of that mess that is a way of representing software but what GitHub allows is, well, for many people to work on the same code, for the code to be maintained consistently, for us to be able to roll back to an earlier stage in the code, for us to incorporate documentation in the code. This kind of process now is also being used for web pages, Git books, and a variety of other uh, types of content in addition to software. Blockchain is a graph. Um, at its heart, uh, you know, it's a directed acyclic graph enabled by cryptography, but at its core, it's a graph. And to understand blockchain, again, chain sort of makes us think of sequences, but really we need to think of it as a graph. Neural networks, and, you know, the, which is the core of artificial intelligence, that's a graph. Uh, different types of neural networks, uh, different types of machine learning algorithms are different types of graphs with different properties. Things like activation functions for each individual entity, connection weights for the connections between the entities, etc. Graphs allow us to produce the fourth item on my list, distributed resources. This is an interesting concept. It's a hard concept, but it's going to become increasingly important over time. 
Now we already have, to a certain degree, distributed resources. There are things called content delivery networks out there now that many websites use. And so when you access a website, like say the New York Times or some other prominent publisher, you're not actually retrieving a document all the way from New York. You're retrieving a copy of that content that has been cached on a nearby server. Obviously, you can see the advantage of that. Uh, the content delivery network allows us to save on a lot of internet traffic and increase access speeds. But distributed resources um, can be used for things like content sharing networks as well. Uh, content delivery networks are contracted by the content provider, such as, say, the New York Times. Content sharing networks, each node in the network is a standalone thing, and the content is just passed from one person to another person to another person to another person. You get the same result, many copies distributed across the network. And really, the major difference between them is in the ownership and the legality. Now, the question is, how do you find a resource on a distributed network? And there's a technology called content-based addressing or hash addressing that's used to identify a particular piece of data. Suppose the New York Times publishes a story and puts it on their network. And then it sends out a link to that story. Well, we could look for it by location. Um, and that's the way a lot of these systems work. There's an awful lot of overhead involved in that. Or we could look for it based on what the content actually is. And the way you do this is you take the original, what we call a pre-image, some text perhaps, or an image or a web page or whatever, run it through a hash function and out the other end pops a digest, a cryptographic hash. Now these hashes are unique for each piece of content. So the hash can be used to find the content. You simply make a request to a server on a distributed network. Do you have this hash? If they have this hash, they send you the content. And you can tell that they sent you the right content because you run the content they sent you through the same hash function to get the right result. So distributed web content protocols are in pilot phase right now. They're not widely used. They're inefficient, they're slow, they're clunky, there's a lot of overhead, a lot of the tech doesn't work but they're becoming more and more important. So you have protocols like GAT or the Interplanetary File System and others that use content addressing. So what happens is you make your request, you request it from the nearest uh, node in the network. If the node has it, it sends it to you. If it doesn't have it, it passes the request along to other nodes. Eventually, it reaches the node that has it. The node that has it sends it to the other node and sends it to you. And that way, you're getting the content from the nearest node in the network that has it. And the content itself spreads through the network. And the more popular it is, the more it will be spread through the network. So. There are many uses for distributed resources in education. I developed something I called content addressable resources for education or CARE. Um, maybe not the best choice of acronyms in the world, but the idea of course was to create educational resources. And instead of using things like licensing um, or you know, repositories, Etc. in order to make these resources widely available, I made them content addressable. I put them on something like IPFS. So once they're out there, they're spread out through the network. The fact that they're out there is what makes them open and accessible. 
we're beginning to see other kinds of distributed resource networks, for example, digital badge and micro credential networks. Uh, if you think about it, uh, usually when we think about badge and micro credential networks, we think about badge authorities or credential granting institutions. But once you have a distributed resource network established, anyone can issue badges, anyone can verify badges or micro credentials. And this has profound implications for the future of education. One thing it does, for example, is allow for credential transferability or credential portability so that a person can amass a range of credentials from different institutions or different providers that together form a picture of what they've learned. Now, is it a degree in the traditional sense? No, because everybody will have a different collection of credentials. But having enough credentials and credentials of a certain sort is kind of equivalent to a degree, or so people may argue. Distributed resources may live on your computer or your friend's computers, or more often they'll live in the cloud. And when they live in the cloud, the resources that we're thinking of don't need to just be things like images, text, books, whatever. They can be these content, or they can be these um, server virtualizations, entire applications that are available on these cloud services. Again, this is beginning to become important. Um, you may have seen some of the uh, artificial intelligence generated um, images. Um, you know, you give it some text, it generates this image from scratch for you. Now I tried to install one on my machine. I have a pretty good machine here, um, but still they required too much memory. But then I accessed a version of it that's sitting on the cloud, took me a second and I was generating images. And so cloud plus decentralization plus virtualization means that anybody can access these complex technical resources on whatever platform they have, a Chromebook, a phone, whatever. In fact, I'm using this right now on my phone to do an audio transcription. So I have a backup of their transcription. So, one of the mechanisms behind all of this is called consensus. In a network, consensus is the problem of synchronizing data. But in a society, consensus is a problem of making decisions. And from a certain perspective, the two amount to the same thing. Now, in a democracy, a lot of decisions are made through some form of voting and majority rule, but there are a lot of weak points to this. One weak point, of course, is the education of the voters. Uh, people might vote for silly things, you know, from your perspective. Another thing is the integrity of the voting process. You know, there's an awful lot of goodwill and trust required in traditional democracy and we're moving into a more and more complex society where trust is more and more difficult, especially when there's money on the line. So one of the things that blockchain enthusiasts have attempted to do is to establish trustless trust in a decentralized system. Um, and they did that after thinking of alternatives to democratic consensus. Uh, a lot of the alternatives, you know, we think, oh yeah, we're in a democracy, everything is democratic. But in fact, we have a lot of other kinds of consensus generating processes out there. Authoritarianism is one. And we see lots of examples of that out there in the world or in our workplaces, or perhaps in our classrooms. Hierarchy and delegation is another 
markets, the invisible hand of the marketplace is in theory supposed to create consensus and practice creates market failures, inequality, poverty, shortages, infrastructure failures, etc. Rumor and innuendo, uh, fake news are ways of creating consensus um, and anarchy. Uh, which doesn't seem like a consensus generating mechanism, but is kind of a consensus generating mechanism where everybody just generates their own consensus. What has transpired over the last 30, 40 years is the development of a host of what are called consensus algorithms. The, the grandfather of these is an algorithm called Paxos. Um, they're intended to solve what's called the Byzantine generals problem. The Byzantine generals problem is you have a collection of people who are supposed to work together, but some of those people are untrustworthy. And how do you make the network work when some of the members of the network are untrustworthy? <clears throat> We can't get into the details of consensus networks here, but you get an idea of how they function from the graphic on the screen, where signals are sent from one entity to the next and through a complex interplay of signals, different interplays depending on different algorithms, you reach a state where all the members of the network agree that something is the case. You know, this ties into a concept in modern data management called single source of truth. And single source of truth is the idea that there is one and only one place where a particular piece of data is recorded. And one of the things that data analysts do when they go into a company, and, and, and we've done that at NRC, is look at their data management system and ask, how do you determine that such and such is true? And that problem is magnified in a decentralized network. But as we come to grips with this, and as we depend more and more on single sources of truth in distributed networks, our idea of community begins to change as well. Uh, community is, you know, seems fairly obvious, defined by membership in a network. You can belong to different communities, different networks, um, and maybe one overall social network consisting of all of society or all of society is defined by the government, whatever. Membership in that network is based on agreement with the consensus protocol. If you don't agree with the protocol, that's fine. You're not part of the network. But if you do agree with the protocol, then, you know, however limited your involvement, you are part of the network. These networks depend on the concept of single sources of truth. And the consensus protocol defines what the members agree is true or how they actually come to that agreement. Now on blockchain, we have very inefficient methods like proof of work or more efficient methods like proof of stake. There may be proof of authority or proof of ownership or simply plain old trust, that's possible. Um, all of these different ways of defining truth are ways of defining communities. So we have a new type of community emerging community as consensus, as opposed to say community as people who live in the same place or community as people who happen to be stuck in the same classroom. The adoption of new technology, new learning technologies is going to need, in my view, to take into account these new forms of community and promote new literacies, enabling students to thrive in them. Again, there are many different ways of creating community. People talk all the time about collaboration. And yeah, teams, collaborations, unions, that's part of them. But there are many alternative kinds of community based on alternative ways of establishing consensus 
cooperatives and networks, or again, in the world of blockchain, distributed autonomous organizations where consensus is defined by a computer algorithm. Yeah, there are issues with that. Six, digital identity. Right now we live in, well, password hell. Uh, I'm sorry to be so colorful with my language, but that really is what it is. The only thing that's worse than that is two-factor authentication, where I can't even type my password in, it's gonna send me a message on my phone or some such thing. Or maybe I, I have a token or something. Well, soon, sooner than you think, I think, passwords, et cetera, will become a thing of the past. And identity theft will become, in an important respect, a thing of the past. Um, and our attention will shift at that time from how we prove who we are. And think about how much attention in the educational space is based on how we prove who we are and more toward how we define ourselves online. So what's coming? New security, sorry, new secure identities backed by uh, decentralized identifiers, uh, DID. Now that's actually already a World Wide Web standard. You can look it up at the URL there. Um, you already carry sort of like DIDs, proprietary siloed DIDs in your devices. Uh, if you use your phone to make payments, for example, or if you have a chip credit card, any of these things uh, is, a, is a digital identifier. But when things become really interesting is when these become one single network, one single graph, so that you can use your digital identifiers the same way you use your wallet today to, to contain your identifiers from all manner of different providers. And you have relations with different entities, the driver's license people, the blood donation people, the credit card people, um, your bank, uh, you know, Canadian Auto Association. I'm just thinking of all the things that are in my wallet. Um, and that's what we'll carry with us in the future. What will the physical form be? Well, open for a question. Could be a chip in our hands. I don't know if we want that, but it could be. Could be on our devices, could be in jewelry. Um, you know, there's probably going to be as many varieties as there are people. Now, these secure identities backed by decentralized identifiers create verifiable credentials and they'll be issued and verified in a distributed network. All that technology that I've been talking about can and will be used for credentials. And here's an example of one. Uh, they're using a public blockchain. They don't have to use a public blockchain, but they are. You have the issuer, like the academic institution. You have the prover, who's the person, the student, who wants to prove that they actually did pass the course. And then the verifier, who takes the proof offered by the prover, checks it against the blockchain where the credential was first submitted, and verifies that it's true. Notice... Once the credential has been issued, the prover and verifier can work on their own without referencing back to the issuer. That creates some resilience in credential networks that doesn't exist today. You know, institutions close, they go out of business, credentials disappear. Um, that's why it's so important to ensure that they don't close right now. But in the future where anybody can be an issuer, you have chaos and thus you have permanent records of credentials. But now these new robust kinds of identity raise all kinds of questions. How do identify yourselves? Who controls access to these credentials? What does this digital identity look like? And on and on and on, there's a whole host of questions. And these are the kind of questions that we're gonna have to grapple with, not just as individuals, but also as, educational institutions. Uh, you know, think about how we create 
a digital identity. Um, already out there in the advertising world, there's a thing called identity graphs. Profiles of you. These exist now. The, the only thing that doesn't exist is our ability to create them for ourselves and, and, and manage them ourselves. But what happens out there in the world is uh, there are systems ingesting billions of events, all of your Facebook posts, all of your Twitter tweets, your website, your work history, uh, stuff you've put in on LinkedIn, your credit history, et cetera. Um, and these are put into a machine language or a machine learning model. In other words, they're put into a big graph. That graph is constructed, all of the connections are made, and then these agencies look for patterns in the graph. Patterns that we might not even have thought of. You know, we think of demographics, we think of where, you know, what national, nationality are you, where do you live, what language do you speak, what's your gender, et cetera. They're looking at patterns we can't even name and these patterns exist because they are relevant from the perspective of advertising and marketing. Well, how do we control that? How do we influence and manage our own digital identity? And what role do academic institutions play in creating a person's digital identity and helping them manage their digital identity? We need to change the way we, we look at things, right? And whoops, that was supposed to be an animated GIF with them all waving, but they're not waving. So I'm disappointed in this slide. Uh, in this new data rich world, we are the content. Um, all of the graph stuff, all of the virtualization, all of the data, ultimately is about us and how we interact together, the things we need to know, the things that we consume, the things that we make, where we live, why we live the way we live. And there's a movement, sometimes called Indie Web, sometimes called Web3, sometimes called Sovereign Identity. It has many hats and many forms where we are taking care of our own content, where we are managing our own content. Now, nobody can own all of the data about themselves entirely because all of the data about ourselves or virtually all of the data involves some kind of connection between ourselves and some external thing. It's, it's all in a big graph. And so the question is, how much influence do we have over that graph? Um, We'll come back to that. I'm gonna jump a bit and look at creative experiences. So much of education currently relies on independent methods, right? We tell people about things rather than having people do things. Uh, you know, we use vectors, reading lectures, videos, even this presentation, I've tried to give you more of an experience by creating the animated GIFs, but you know, you can imagine how, poor it would be without the narration behind it. So again, still indirect experiences. In the future, and indeed even today to some degree, uh, education becomes a case where instead of delivering content, the teacher models and demonstrates successful practice. And the student tries to emulate that based on what they experience. In other words, uh, learning becomes immersive and experiential. But it's not just about doing things in a virtual world. It's actually about creating and designing things in a virtual world or in the real world. Uh, the creative experiences can take many forms. It can be open working. I have an example of that. I have a, a playlist on my YouTube channel called Stephen Follows Instructions, where I take you know, some set of instructions, install this software, create this application, whatever, and try to follow the instructions with hilarious results uh, because the instructions are very often bad. Um, job shadowing is another way of doing it. Apprenticeship, mentorship, you can think of a wide range of immersive creative experiences. 
And the whole idea here is to get the direct experience rather than to be told about it or learn about it secondhand. More and more, people are doing things in these virtual and online environments and doing it openly and sharing this with their network of friends. Uh, we see this already in gaming a lot, and pretty much only in gaming, where people are playing their game and streaming it on Twitch and you see the person there doing a running commentary. I've done a whole bunch of those with a video game called No Man's Sky. I didn't put on the link because unless you're really into No Man's Sky, you probably won't like it. But the idea here is that we have tools today that allow us to work and do things and also share the experience. Twitch is what we're looking at here. Open broadcasting system is something that I use alike. Even tools like Teams or Slack or Discord are ways of trying to make the work experience more open and more interactive. And all of this dialogue, all of this interactivity takes the work and puts it into a context and enables learners to see it as a process rather than an artifact. I talked about recognition earlier. Being in this workplace environment or in this creative environment allows people to recognize things much like the advertisers recognize demographics in ways that can't be articulated, in ways that can't be talked about, but in ways they can learn so that you can see when a fish is well done. Uh, you can recognize when somebody has given you a good reception. You can feel the passage of time. These are ineffable kinds of personal knowledge, as Michael Polanyi would say. Leads us to recognition. Uh, today, we rely on artificial assessment. We rely on artificial instruction. We rely on artificial assessment, like tests and exams. And I don't need to talk about the many flaws of such a system or the misuse of some of the current technologies that I've been talking about like artificial intelligence and surveillance and the rest, in order to try to make these artificial assessments better. We're not going to be able to make them better, not, not to any significant degree. Um, one way we can make them a bit better is in the assessment side. We used to assess them by hand. You know, it was manual labor. And I know because I, I have the experience of having a foot of marking on my desk, you know, measuring my marking in, in linear feet. And I'd start coffee in one hand, pen in the other, start on my papers and mark them by hand. Um, not a very consistent and certainly not a very efficient way of assessing work. And so a variety of artificial intelligence technologies have come on stream, these exist today, to automatically assess uh, long form material like tests and essays and assignments, et cetera. And it's a recognition task. We put them into groups, you know, A, B, C. Um, and sometimes we can explain why the AI made the decision it did, sometimes we can't, and that's an issue, of course. But why are we automatically grading tests? That doesn't make sense. We need to refine these tools, and we need to refine them not for tests, but for actual authentic tasks. So we use AI to look at how somebody is actually, you know, an, an existing expert is actually performing a task and then use that model in the assessment of other people attempting to perform the task. Uh, this has a variety of advantages. For one thing, it reduces the potential for bias because we're not working with signs and symbols and, and indirect signifiers anymore. We're working with actual, real, authentic practice. Um, does it eliminate the bias? Well, no. And that's something that we need to keep into account. But also, it allows anyone to perform an assessment. It's like when you're sitting there watching figure skating, right? Yeah, the judges have their score, but you have your score too. 
Um, and you know, you're all working with the same, shall we say, source of truth. The the video performance of the videos of the figure skating, or perhaps the actual performance. Um, we're drawing it from this person's uh, presentation of their skill and ability, and we each go away with our own assessment. And you know, the the scorers in the arena will perform one function, but you know, you as a spectator, you have your favorite figure skaters, the people you follow, the people you cheer for, based on your own kind of assessment, and that can happen not just on a performance level in structured settings like this, but for everybody all the time in actual public performances or actual personal performance or portfolios. If people are working openly, they can be assessed openly. Now that's something that scares a lot of people, but it's also something that has a lot of potential. And the potential is this, you don't need credentials anymore actually. The credential of the future will be a job offer. A company out there has run their assessments against who knows, hundreds, thousands, millions of personal portfolios. The digital identity that people managing their own digital identity using, say, the indie web have presented to the world. They identify someone who, according to their systems, matches the needs of the job that they have based on what their previous employees or experts have done. And they just simply offer the job to that person. And so a learning institution isn't trying to create a single set of skills for everybody anymore. And that wouldn't actually be very useful. Uh, they're trying to consider how to help students create their own desirable profile that satisfies a wide range of actually undefined performance criteria. I, I once used to say, you know, the uh, when I was teaching, I'd tell the class, the assessment method I will use in this course is arbitrary and unfair, just like real life. Now, of course, I was kidding, but it will be in the future arbitrary and unfair unless we think about how to do it properly. Agency is necessary in such a system. What we learn, what we do, why we learn uh, ultimately is shaped by the learner. And, and the reason why it's shaped by the learner is because the standards that are set by external agencies become less and less relevant, especially the more static they are, the less able to respond to dynamically changing environments they are. Agency is a shift in the relative standing of an individual with respect to community institutions, governments, for better or worse. And it's impacted by technology. And there's a growing acceptance of this technology, everything from automated publishing to stock trading, content alerts, et cetera, the ways we and in institutions, et cetera, project ourselves in the world. Individual agency is what these consensus-based decentralized communities are designed to augment. But how much agency should people have? How much is too much? And what other types of agency are there? How do we create and define community agency, network agency, organizational agency, and, and keep that open and voluntary for the members involved? And what in this model counts as success? Again, we're so used to us as educational institutions defining success. But priorities are going to be established by individual conditions and character and defined by a variety of elements. And so we need to be able to allow success to be evaluated by these wider metrics. And that's a tough call for educational institutions. All of this combines to create an infrastructure. And this infrastructure touches everything that we touch in our lives. 
And what the, happened in the pandemic and what's happening in new technological environments is that we're going through a reorganization of social infrastructure to fit these new priorities. So we're seeing everything from uh, you know, the, the great resignation to quiet quitting, all of these things are signs that we're looking for different priorities. Uh, and we've got tensions between things like anonymity, encryption, zero knowledge data, and things like accountability, resilience, security, robustness. You know, where does the Panama Papers fit in this? We're addressing gaps in our social fabric. We're addressing the need for greater individual and collective capacity. And we're at the same time trying to establish through things like single source of truth, resilience of our scientific and industrial infrastructure, including supply chains, including our news media and a whole range of other related things. And finally, we can't escape the pressing and immediate concern of climate and environmental security, sustainability. So all of this together is the technological and, and, and I'm looking for that other word, but it's in the title, uh, the trends of the future. And these form the framework for the questions that I think that we as an educational community need to be asking in the future, you know, once we've dealt with artificial intelligence, the metaverse and blockchain. I'm Stephen Downs and that's my presentation and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. Wow, lots to uh, digest there and think about. Um, there's been a lot of great conversations going on in the chat. Thank you for that. Um, we're at about time. So if you do have questions or anything burning that um, you want to follow up on, you can um, contact uh, Stephen or you can contact um, us through Contact North and uh, we can connect you that way. Um, so thank you very much, Stephen, for sharing your insights and expertise on the Futurescape for learning technology. Lots to wrap your head around, but um, we have summarized the main points in a paper with the same title as the webinar posted on Teach Online. And I'll put that in the chat. Um, so that might uh, provide a good uh, overview as well. Um, and a big thank you for everyone for joining us. I can see by the comments that are coming up um, that you found this session as fascinating as I did. Um, just a reminder that I will post the recording and the uh, slides um, once it's processed to teachonline.ca under the webinar tab, um, where you'll also find our lineup of upcoming webinars. So coming up next is next October 19th is How to Engage Silent Learners, hosted by Alistair Krillman. So hope to see you there. Thank you again, Stephen. And thank you everybody for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day.